Last week we began a series on our mission statement here, and uh, today we're going to continue that, and we're going to look at specifically at one of the aspects of that mission, being the hands of Jesus, and we're going to, hopefully, uh, we're going to, is it working back there? We've had some technical challenges today. We're hopefully going to hear and see a, a song. I want you to listen to the words of this song as it challenges us to think about the hands of Jesus and then what can we be as a result of that. Bleeding in the garden 
his hands tools of creation stronger than nations power without end and yet through them we find our truest friend his hands sermons of kindness healing men's blindness halting years of And clearly now I 
I like the last phrase, the uh, part of that song where it says, He showed me as I could be, and I will work to make these hands like his of Galilee. You know, it's a wonderful message and a wonderful thought as we think about just being like Jesus. Last week we looked at the first two phrases of our mission statement, love God and love our neighbors. And we looked at the scriptural foundation of those out of Matthew and Luke. Uh, Matthew and Luke. And how Jesus said these two statements, love God and love our neighbors, he said those are the most important statements. He said, in fact, all the law and the prophets hang on those two things. The foundational uh, principles of loving God and loving our neighbors are so important to being who God wants us to be and, and the type of person that he wants us to be towards others. But how does that practically find itself lived out? It's one thing to understand the theological underpinnings. It's another thing to take that and apply it to life. And that's where the be the hands, feet, and heart of Jesus come in. And today, I want us to think about just that first aspect of being the hands of Jesus. Now, some might ask, well, can you really be the hands of Jesus? Is it possible to be Jesus? Well, yes and no. We'll probably not walk on water or feed, you know, 5,000 with two fish or five loaves of bread or, or touch the, the leper or heal the lame or, or raise the dead. But does that mean that we should give up on being the hands of Jesus? What does that mean? What, what's behind that concept? What does it involve for us? You see, Jesus said, Be ye perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. He didn't say, Well, I want you to think about it. I want you to make a stab at it. Give it your best shot. And go ahead and try to be like, you know, as good as you can be. No, he came forward with a very bold and forthright statement. He said, Be ye perfect, therefore, even as my heavenly Father is perfect. And we had this discussion uh, on, on this mission statement. Do we use be the hands of Jesus or strive? You know, and we settle with, no, it, it's, you can strive on a lot of things, but sometimes we're always looking for, as Tom said in his communion meditation, excuses. And I like this challenge. We need to be the hands of Jesus. Not that we're going to be perfect at it, but I found that people basically respond to their expectations or the challenges given to them. When I was in youth ministry, I was a dean of a high school uh, week of uh, church camp several different times. And I found the best weeks that I had is when I would address the kids. And whenever we had opportunity, you know, you'd always be announcing things and stuff. I'd tell them how good they were doing, how great it is that they're here, and all of these things. And we had some of the best campers in some of the best weeks, and I think a lot of it is because they lived up to that expectation. They, they said, you are in this mindset, and you're doing well, and they lived up to that. And if Jesus would just said, well, I want you to give it a shot. I want you to think about, you know, being kind of like God, and if it works out for you, but he doesn't. He makes a bold statement. He says, be like, be, action. Strive as hard as you possibly can. Be like Jesus. Is that possible? How does that happen? Well, I read a story about a missionary. Said he was shipwrecked. Floated on shore of an island and the natives on the island came out and found him there. And, and they took him in. They nursed him back to health. And he ended up just living with them. And he lived there. And uh, for 20 years, 
And stories told of how missionaries came 20 years after he had, he had found himself shipwrecked there, and they got off the boat, and they immediately began telling him about Jesus, telling the people on the island about Jesus. And they said, oh, we know who he is. He's lived with us for 20 years. <laughs> See, that first missionary, he lived in such a way that they understood who Jesus was. It's being who Jesus is. That's what caught God calls us. So today, I'm not going to teach you how to walk on water or how to feed 5,000 with two fish or five loaves of bread or how to touch the blind and make them see, literally being the hands of Jesus. But I do want us to think about what does it mean in my life that I can be who God wants me to be. I found a verse in Psalm 90 verse 17 that I think summarizes it so well. It's a prayer that maybe can be all of our prayers. It says, may the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Dear Lord, will you take my life and will you establish the work of your hands in mine? Will I be the person that you want us to be? It's just a great verse as we think about this. You know, just thinking about hands literally, when you look at the human hand, what God has created, that in itself is a pretty amazing thing. Did you know that you don't have any muscles in your fingers? You have no muscles whatsoever in your fingers. But your fingers are strong enough to hold you up. They're to, uh, to grip things. They can do some amazing things. How does that happen? Well, the muscles are actually in the palm and in the forearm. They're all connected to your fingers by tendons. There's 17 muscles in your palm, 17 muscles in your forearms. And that's the only way that your fingers find strength is through those tendons that are attached to those muscles. There are 29 major bones, 29 major joints. And God makes all of those things work together to make us unique from the rest of creation. Now what do I mean by that? The ability to touch your little pinky and your ring finger to your thumb separates you from all the rest of God's creation just in the design of our hands. There's no other creature that can do that. That allows us to do all kinds of things with our hands. How many of you used your hands in some way this morning before you came to church? <laughs> Good. I'm glad to see that because most of you drove here today. I'm glad to know that you had those hands on that steering wheel. Think about how we're separate from creation just because of the way he designed our hands. But think also the dynamic and the power would come if we would understand that we can be separate, we can be unique as his people, as his children, when we become his hands and his heart and his feet to those in this world that need so much the love and the, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. So I want you to think about that. What does it mean to be set apart? What does it mean to be the hands of Jesus? God is depending on us. God is depending on your hands. And I want you to think, how's he doing that? The story is told, and I tried to do as much research as I could to verify this, but I want to show you a picture here. It's a statue. It's a statue. The story is told that during World War II in Strasbourg, Germany, during one of the bombing raids, that this area was bombed. And after it was, uh, the raid was over, the parishioners of this church went back to the church to see if their church had survived. They were pleased to find that the statue of Jesus had survived. But as they got closer, they noticed that a beam had fallen down right across where his arms were, and it took off his forearms and his hands. And that's, as you see in their picture, they're missing. He's missing the forearms and the hands. Well, they decided to set the, the, uh, the statue back up and decide what to do. A sculpture in the area came and offered to replace the broken arms and hands and restore the statue to the way it was. But the church leaders met to consider what they should do, and they decided not to accept his offer. Why? Because they felt that a statue without the hands of Jesus would be a great illustration to the fact that God's work is to be done through His people to be His hands to those who need help. And there's that statue. It's a great visual. 
Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 20. He said, He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making His appeal through us. We are ambassadors for Christ as if God is making His appeal through us. He is depending on us to be His hands in a world that needs help. So today I want to throw out a few thoughts and ideas on what it means, what God wants us to be if we are to use our hands for Him. And the first is simply this, our hands are to be hands of serving, or hands of service. Mark chapter 10 verse 45 says this, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. You think of the rulers and the, the people we think of in the, the uh, New Testament and the Old Testament time or just any time in antiquity. antiquity uh, rulers, they were the ones to be served. They had servants. They would take care of all their needs. You've probably seen movies like I have of uh, some of the Romans. They would even lift their hands to eat. They'd have people come and they'd feed them grapes, you know. They wanted to be served all the time. And yet Jesus says, look, I've not come to be served, and, but I've come to serve. And maybe the biggest illustration that we're aware of is when Jesus in the upper room there took the basin and the towel and went around and washed the dirty feet of the disciples. And he taught them an amazing lesson on service. God calls us to have hands that serve him to apply what we know in practical ways. It's interesting, when I was in seminary, in, uh, after I'd gone to Bible College there in Lincoln, Illinois, there were some students there that they seemed to, they loved to study and they, they loved school. And they were there all the time. And they were the ones always, you know, uh, at all the special seminars and things. And, and when they would graduate, they would decide that they were going to go for another degree. And uh, they'd stay around and they'd, they'd work. On, I called them professional students. And what was sad about several of those guys, they never went out, though, and got involved in ministry. They never preached on the weekends. They never got involved at all in a weekend ministry. They had all the knowledge. They could write the papers. They could attend the lectures. They could do all those things. But somewhere they failed to go out and be the hands of Jesus. I think God wants us to understand His Word. I think He wants us to study. I think we need to understand the deep things of God. But if that's all you do, then you've fallen short of what God has intended for you. You see, Jesus he had hands of service. He did things that nobody else would do. He didn't let His position get in the way. And our hands are to be hands of service. If you've known me at all, you've noticed that over the last several years, I've really challenged us a lot to do a lot of different things. To get involved in the community, to uh, do, be involved in the school, to uh, uh, reach out in your neighborhood. To do a, Why? Because I firmly believe that God wants us to be salt and light in this world. And that involves sometimes getting our hands dirty doing it. It involves getting taken out of our comfort zone. It involves um, doing all kinds of things. It's good. It's good. I've had people who have come to me and they've dealt with depression. Now, I'm not a professional counselor or a psychologist or psychiatrist or anything like that. But I've seen people and I said, you know what the best thing you need to do? The best thing you could do for yourself to get yourself out of this cycle is you need to get out and start doing something for someone else. <laughs> Because when you get involved in this depression, it's kind of a, like a snowball rolling down the hill and you close yourself in on the world and all of a sudden, you know, you're the only thing that matters and you're at the center of the world. And it's an amazing thing. I can't explain why or how it happens, but I know that when you go and you do something for someone else, you receive blessings that you don't really understand. I know there's been times I've gone into situations to minister to someone and I'm the one leave that has left because I was ministered to. 
You see, God calls our hands to be hands of service, to get down and dirty, to have a hand-on experience, literally, in what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Jesus set the example, and we need to follow his example. Let us have hands of service. It takes all different kinds of people doing all different kinds of things. And the remodeling that, that we're doing, that have been involved in, there's been people that have come that have painted, there's been carpenters come, they've put up, you know, trim, they've, you know, the electrical stuff needed to be done. Uh, we, we Just cleaning up was a, has been a big help. Had some guys this week that were from the Bethel uh, um, a congregation, the Hispanic congregation. They put the stone on the front of the stone stage. They uh, ripped up all the carpet out there. They're going to lay the carpet in here. They've, they've done a lot of things that we didn't have the skill to do, but as brothers and sisters in Christ, they've come and been a part of that. It's been great to see, you know, everybody coming together, and that's what it takes. The church, his people, being the hands of Jesus, working together for one common cause, the kingdom of God. So think about ways your hands can be hands of service. But let me challenge you with this, that sometimes, secondly, our hands have to be hands of sacrifice. Hands of sacrifice. I think it's interesting that Jesus, when he met with Thomas in the upper room, he was there in the upper room with Thomas, and Thomas had been absent the first time Jesus had appeared to his disciples. So they were all talking about it the next time they got together. And Thomas said, hey, look, here I, until I see him, until I put my hands in his side, I am not going to believe him. Poof, all of a sudden Jesus appears. Can you imagine how surprised he felt at that point? And in John chapter 20, verse 27, he said this to to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put into my side. Stop doubting and believe. He literally used his hands to show Thomas that he really was who he was. His hands of sacrifice. And Thomas believed. Our mission sometimes means sacrificing it means sacrificing some of our time, some of our money, some of our energy, some of our comfort. And it's different for everybody in different ways. But I really encourage you and challenge you to think about how can my hands be hands of sacrifice to go to the next level that maybe I've never gone to before, to do something for someone that uh, a year ago I would have never dreamed of doing. One final thing, our hands need to be hands of love. We need to reach out to God and accept His love. I like the Psalms. Psalm 143 says this, I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. And Psalm 134 says, Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise our Lord. I think the most important thing we can first grasp is, is that we need to reach out to God to accept His love. And when we find His love, then we in turn find love that we can share with others. Paul tells Timothy, Lift up holy hands of prayer without anger or disputing. Hands of love, touching people that need to be touched in ways that we never thought possible on our own strength, but only through His. Let our hands be hands of love. I want to close by a, a kind of a reading. I don't know really what to call it. I could have included it in my sermon and used it and made it look like it was mine and you would have been really impressed, but I just don't do that. So uh, I always want to read it to you because he says it well. It says, they must have been rough, the hands of the village carpenter. In an age without gloves or skin creams, he shoved stones into place, absorbed splinters, hewed timber, and gripped lumber with his bare-fisted fingers. In a day without sunscreen lotions, he labored under the blistering Middle Eastern sun. In an era with modern, without modern machinery, he raised houses, erected buildings, fashioned furniture, and repaired children's toys.
His hands must have developed a thick layer of protective hide that was obvious to those who shook his hand or felt his touch. But oh, what gentle hands. Never squeezing too hard, touching too roughly, or overzealously slapping another's back. And what powerful hands. The trace of a single finger could restore sight to the blind, bring life to the dead, heal a leper's skin, or lift a suffering soul from life's dust. And oh, what wounded hands. They bore the scars that no lotion can heal and no oil could help. They were the hands of Jesus. The gospel uses the words hands, fingers, and touch nearly 200 times. And all the words refer, uh, and the words often refer to Jesus. Jesus put out his hand and touched him. So he touched her hand. He went in and took her by the hand. Then he touched their eyes. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand. Jesus came by and touched them. The little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. Jesus wasn't afraid to touch others. Leprous skin didn't repulse him, nor did he hesitate to handle the filthy feet of his disciples in the upper room. <coughs> Are your hands open? Generous towards a needy person whom God brings across your path? Toward his work that needs support? Towards those depending upon your provision? We must use our hands to help others. At the beginning of Christ's ministry, we read, read in Luke 4.40, when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed him. How can our hands become a blessing to others? Perhaps wiping the brow of a fevered child or cooking a meal for a lonely single, typing a note to one needing encouragement, cutting flowers for a neighbor, wiping the noses of infants in the church nursery, handing out bulletins with a smile and a handshake on Sunday, knocking on the door of someone needing the Lord. Your hands can do His work every day. Oh, to be like Jesus, to have the same touch, the same grip on life, the same open-handed generosity, the same beautiful beckoning hands as our Lord. Look down at your hands right now. May God use them for His glory. Let's pray.